telling you that my background is a med surge nurse. Um, <clears throat> I was on a urology based floor, also a kidney transplant <coughs> floor. Um, now that I look back on it, we also took care of weaning vents, so it was probably more of a step down type of a setting. Um, but it was med surge ratio, so they might have, you know, pulled one over on me. But, <laughs> but either way, that's all right, because um, I learned a ton on that particular floor. And then. Um, my next uh, portion was in the emergency department, which I was really thankful for all my urology background because then um, I was able to place a lot of those difficult foleys, was very knowledgeable about the coup de catheter and, and when to utilize that particular foley catheter. And then um, um, also with, with hematuria, because lots of times hematuria, sometimes we can kind of uh, freak out a little bit about it and it's really not that big of a deal and we just need to know how to manage it. However, <coughs> Do you guys know that we do something called hack attack rounds here? Yes. Okay. So in hack attack rounds, we're actually rounding on every single one of the central lines that is within our facility and every single one of our Foley catheters. So since we started that, I think we've looked at, um, we started that I think in October, end of September. And, and we're doing that, we try to do it every other week, um, but we've looked at I think over 500 Foley catheters, um, and I think uh, around 350 of central lines. And we're giving the information back to the primary nurses taking care of that patient to give them feedback on how well the, the line or Foley catheter is taken care of. Um, so the Foley catheters, some, we have found some Foley catheters that were a little surprising to us. And then after some further investigation, I found out that this is actually how Lippincott recommends that we handle some of our hematuria cases. And so um, this is my, my phone. I'll let you guys just pass it around since I'm um, cornered. And, um, and so that you can kind of see and get a good idea of this is really not what we want to do for when it comes to hematuria. So we can kind of pass that around because I don't want to uh, talk about that too much until everybody's kind of gotten a good visual uh, visualize of that. Okay. So I'm going to get started. I'll repeat a little bit of what Dr. Moskowitz had to say, um, uh, but ultimately, I really want you to hear some of the things, and I'll, and I'll guide Dr. Gruber to go over the PowerPoint slides uh, once he arrives so that nothing is redundant for you, but then you're also still hearing it from the urologist's point of view. So I'll, I'll mainly focus on the, the nursing portions, and I will make sure that Dr. Gruber talks about the, the slides that he needs to with his expertise. So normal anatomy, I'll let him speak to this, but one of the things that Dr. Moskowitz really highlighted on is when you're placing the Foley catheter where you typically run into a lot of issues is right here, uh, right before you're getting to the actual, the prostate. Um, and so I'll have Dr. Gruber go over this a little bit more, but just think about the, that um, sphincter that's right there. Um, and if the, the male is greater than 65, that more than likely that you're gonna have some prostate issues. So, female anatomy. Um, so, Dr. Moskowitz really highlighted on the fact that most of us, females included, are really uncomfortable with the female anatomy. Um, and if you get older, you know, your hormones start to lessen, and then things are not as um, put together as what we are when we are younger. Okay, good. Um, okay, so possible anatomy and issues. I'm, a, I'm actually going to have Dr. Gruber uh, go over this. He will be here with us um, by 8 o'clock. So I'll go over some of the tips on how to place the Foley catheter. Uh, so Eurojet, who's familiar with the Eurojet? Nobody? Okay, so that's a light. Oh, you are. Okay, great. Um, but that's 8 South. That's right there, right? So that's our Euro floor. 8 South is one of our gurus floors right now. Um, that is frequently called for a difficult Foley insertion. And so what we want to do is we want to kind of create a, a broader team of, of experts. In this room, um, do I have any ED folks in this room? Okay, great, thanks, perfect. Because I know you guys get a lot of stuff that walk into the emergency depart department and they're kind of doing a dance because they haven't been able to urinate for quite a, long, quite a while. And so it's good to have you here. Okay, so <clears throat> lidocaine jelly in men, I'm going to actually work with Pharmacy and Sarah Green on this to see if we can get this in, to be incorporated with a um, order set that would automatically get ordered so that if you come in as a difficult Foley expert 
and you identify that this is a, a male patient greater than 65, lots of times if we go ahead and insert the lidocaine jelly in men, it'll help kind of um, help decrease their anxiety and then help also decrease some of the discomfort that we could have by placing the Foley catheter. So the Eurojet actually is a, is a syringe and it has a, a tip on the end of it and you actually just insert that into the penis itself and you just squirt the Eurojet in and then what I've heard from men um, is if you wait greater than a minute it really helps decrease, um, it's just an anesthetic that helps them with that. Not really for use of women but helps men. The anxious patient. Um, we could give them Ativan. I, I doubt that we're going to be getting, giving them Versed, but you know, really just talking them through <coughs> the the process when you first get in there. You know, how many times do you walk into a room and, and uh, if you present yourself as the expert with the Foley catheter, that that immediately puts the patient's mind at ease already, um, um, and just helping them with breathing techniques. Uh, my personal thing that I do when I when I put a Foley into a man is I tell them to point their toes like they're going to step on a gas pedal. I don't believe that this re relaxes their uh, sphincter at all. Um, I think that this is a completely distraction technique mm -hmm. and typically when I when I tell men to point their toes they aggressively point their toes <laughs> um, like they're going 100 miles an hour and it helps me slide the catheter in because they're no longer focused on just resisting me in general. So just distraction like we already know as nurses is is deep breathing distraction is typically what will help our uh, male patients. So making sure that we retract foreskin if possible, the ceniitis of the just the head of the penis, um, you know, and, and I could be uh, very you know, anatomically correct and tell you the correct terms, but sometimes it's just easier to just say it as it is so that we all know exactly what I'm talking about. So lots of men uncircumcised. Um, we have to be careful to make sure that we retract the foreskin as much as we uh, possibly can. But then when we, after we prep it and if we can see the head of the, the penis and then the entrance in, into the urethra, then we, we prep that and then we go ahead and we insert. Now, however, we want to make sure that after we insert the Foley catheter that we very gently put the foreskin back into its proper place. Hold up the pan. So this is uh, related to females that are uh, very heavy set for us. So there's lots of times, or we should be already, when we're inserting a Foley catheter, just like when we do a central line, we should have multiple hands. So just in case we have somebody that's moving all around. If you have a very obese uh, woman, what you're going to want to do is you're, you're going to want to have one hand to do the left labia and one hand to do the right labia and then you can have one person that's actually doing the um, the insertion and then I've even been in a situation where I've had people lift up the, the panis or the, the, the lower part of the abdomen. When you have everybody get things moved around appropriately typically you can really identify where you want to be placing the actual Foley catheter. <clears throat> Another great tip for, for placing a, a Foley catheter on a female is my ER nurses probably know this, when you, when you do not have a stretcher that is capable for doing a, a pelvic exam, you slide a bedpan underneath a, a female patient. That lifts them up um, and then if you have their legs in the frog, uh, frog style, that will just you know, make things to be out of the way so that you can actually get a good visualization of what's happening there. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that what we typically do is if I'm having a tough time and this is what we actually instruct our female patients that do self-cath at home all the time is you can um, insert your finger or, or two into the, into the vagina and, and that if you go right above your fingers you know that you'll hit the urethra as well. So and I say finger versus anything else because we've had a situation in our facility just recently where we utilized the sponge in the OR space. Any OR people here? We forgot it in. <laughs> Not okay, right? Um, definitely <coughs> uncomfortable for the patient um, because we we've, didn't know if that was part of the surgical procedure or what had actually happened there. So. That's why I'm not going to forget my finger, right? That will come with me. Uh, so that's why I say utilizing that and explaining it to the patient of what's going on because I want to make sure that I get the Foley catheter in a very clean technique um, and I don't want to, uh, you know, accident if I, and if I do accidentally insert the Foley catheter into the vagina, leave it in there. Go get a different Foley catheter because now you've identified where the vagina is, not the urethra, right? Does that make sense to everyone? 
Is this a practice that you're already doing? <coughs> yes. Good. Good. Okay. <coughs> okay. So to verify placement, more for for men than it is for females, but slide the catheter all the way up to the hub. You know what I'm talking about there? Okay. Um, Here's the, the CUNY catheter, whether you're familiar or not. But So what I mean is, you know, if this is the, the penis, the head of the penis, to go all the way to that, because then you know that you're there. You know, you can, you can know if it slides in or if you start to feel it kind of folding upon itself. So um, that's one good way to know that you're, you're there. Uh, don't inflate the balloon until there is some sort of urine drainage. And if you're questioning if there's some sort of urine drainage, then you can actually go ahead and do an, an irrigation to see if that will, if you know, if you irrigate it and it goes in smoothly, um, then you'll know that it's there. Um, Dr. Moskowitz talked about how the bladder kind of is folded upon itself, and so irrigating with just 30 cc's is not going to do anything. He he recommended that we actually irrigate with a syringe, you know, with three or four of the syringes before we pull back to see if we actually get any kind of fluid back. Because if you put in 30, he's like, you're, you're, whatever you pull back, it may or may not be the fluid that you actually put in. <clears throat> okay, so which Foley catheter should I use? So here we have the, the normal prostate, and here we have the enlarged prostate. <clears throat> so when we're putting in a regular Foley catheter, and we start to get resistance, and this could be for, for men greater than 65, um, or at any other, any other time, as the difficult Foley team, what you should really walk in, and you should have a conversation with the patient and say, tell me about your history. Do you have a tough time going to the bathroom? Is your, is your stream full and no issues whatsoever? I mean, if they talk to you about how they're up in the middle of the night multiple times, if they talk to you about how you know their stream sh starts and stops, then, then you know right away that you could potentially just go straight to a CUDE catheter so that you know that it's in, you're not doing any kind of damage trying to insert a regular Foley catheter. So the nice thing about the CUDE catheter is that right here is where you're gonna have a tough time because <clears throat> If if this is the if this is the prostate and and then up here is the bladder, <clears throat> what I really heard from Dr. Moskowitz um, on Tuesday was when you insert the regular Foley catheter, it's going to come right here and it's going to hit because it's so enlarged. If you insert the CUDE catheter, <clears throat> is everybody familiar with the CUDE catheter? Mm -hmm. I'll show you if, if right after this if 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 you're not. If you insert the CUDE catheter, then it, it hits that bottom part, but the, the firmness at the tip of the CUDE catheter actually allows it to just push right up and then go exactly where you want it to go. This right here is the CUDE catheter, and I'll pass this around so you all can take a look at it, and you can see that it's a little bit firm right there, and then it's angled. The way that you know <clears throat> how to correctly insert the CUDE catheter is to make sure that this is up. So if I was going to insert it, I'd go like this. Okay? If this is down, that's not right. We want to make sure that it hits the prostate and goes up and into the right spot. Okay? So our little guy right there goes. You're not going to find a CUDE catheter that's hooked to a Foley catheter or bag. Mm -hmm. You're going to have an open system now. And in nursing, open systems are taboo, right? We don't want to have open systems. We want to make sure that we have a closed system, that we have that pretty little red tape that's there um, to show that we have, have it sealed. <clears throat> However, I'm going to say that you guys are experts, that when you go in to insert a Foley catheter that's now an open system, that your technique is superb, um, that you are teaching and educating the nurses after you place this Foley catheter how to care for these Foley catheters. Because it's not only the CUDE catheter that you're going to have to insert that's going to be an open system, it's also your three-way. We'll go over that in a little bit. Did you have a question or you're just raising your hand for fun? No? Good. Okay. I won't. Okay. <clears throat> so you can try a 16 or 18 French CUDE catheter. Um, and even when we get to the hematuria portion, you know, some of the hematuria catheters are absolutely huge. And not, it's not necessary to go big or go home with the Foley catheter. Uh, you, you could utilize a smaller hematuria catheter in order to kind of get the same effect with your irrigation. And this just actually shows a urethral uh, uh, structure. <clears throat> and sometimes, if you, if you start out with your 16 French catheter and that doesn't really work, 
And you can try to use a smaller catheter. Sometimes what I found with men, <coughs> when I went to go insert a 16 French, um, <coughs> and it didn't work, sometimes if I utilized the 18 French, then it worked, it worked perfectly too. But again, that's gonna be an open system. And honestly, if you're utilizing a 16 French on a male and it, and it did not work, then just switch to a CUDA catheter. Um, right beside me is the urology cart. Is anybody not familiar with the urology cart? Did you know that we had one? So <clears throat> let's say that um, a nurse calls you up and you go up to the room and you try to place it and you couldn't get it. So then you call the urologist. The urologist is gonna say to you, make sure that the urology cart is at the room and ready to go because this has everything that the urologist is gonna wanna have when they're trying to insert that Foley catheter into the patient. So this is the urology cart. Um, it's good to have if, if you need it in particular, um, and it's good to have, it's always good to have for the urologist so that you're prepped and ready to go. <coughs> Central, Central Supply has these, so you can request it from them. So again, um, how do you know the difference between uh, BPH and the stricture? So you walk into the room, you talk to the patient about how you're expert with Foley catheters that you'll understand with you know the different catheters for their needs. Um, you ask them about their past medical history, um, and and you can pick the right catheter depending upon that. So <clears throat> I'll have him, uh, Dr. Gruber, go over this a little bit too. And I and like I said, go bigger or go smaller. Sometimes I just try to go 18 French, or you can flip to the CUDA catheter. This is just the, the fibrosis, so um, this, I mean, if you have a patient that is restricted at all, this is a, this is a really good view of it. You, you may or may not be able to visualize anything, and when, when we were talking with Dr. Moskowitz last Tuesday, or this past Tuesday, you know, he, he was like, just give it a shot, attempt it, get it as clean as we can get it, and then give it a shot, because more than likely, they're retaining, and they're having some other issues, so let's see what we can do. Here we're just talking about the uh, meatus being located in a different uh, section of the penis. Don't, don't be afraid of that. It's, it's just a different part. And so you can still slide a Foley catheter in. So uh, that's the phimosis that I already talked about. Is just You can try to get somebody to help retract the foreskin, for especially in over overweight men. Again, <clears throat> it's just a focus of making sure that you have enough hands on deck. Don't try to attempt it by yourself if, if you need to, to try to get the family catheter in. Um, get some help, and you may get a help from another expert person that sees something that you don't see. Okay. So overweight uh, females, just make sure that you have enough assistance to hold the panels up. And again, the bedpan, um, using the bedpan, putting frog legs, um, that, that typically has a great way to expose the, the genital area. So hematuria, size of Foley catheter. So <clears throat> when we have a regular 16 French um, Foley catheter, the, the eye of the Foley catheter itself, who has my Coudet catheter? Thank you, um, Dave. Um, so just take a look at the eye of that Foley catheter there, and then you can pass it around again so that people can see the eye of it. So what I'm talking about with that is what kind of clots do you expect to pass through that? Because that's not any different than what your 16th French Foley catheter is. So if you have somebody that's complaining of a hematuria, why put in a regular Foley catheter if you know that it's just gonna clot up right away? And I passed around, did everybody have an opportunity to see that photo that was on my camera? So when I, when I first saw that, um, with my background, I was like, why the heck are we hooking up IV fluid to the specimen port of a Foley in order to irrigate it? Because as you saw, that hematuria was so gross, um, with like as in large amount, right? Not as in like gross, but there was so much copious um, hematuria that was within that Foley catheter that it was actually, it, the irrigation was doing nothing. There was a backflow on the irrigation itself because there was too much pressure that was within the Foley. That's my spotlight. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> and then I realized that it's actually Lippincott that recommends that for us. 
Um, and I just want to let you guys know, you guys are some of the first people to know that HCA has decided to move away from utilizing lip and cotton, not because it's a, it's a poor product, but just because that, that was a decision that, that they had made. We're going to use a different evidence-based uh, resource set for us. Um, so coming soon, all of our policies that say reference lip and cot will now say, you know, just reference our resource that, uh, database that we actually have available. So what I'm asking for you guys is, I think we can utilize an irrigation system like that if the hematuria that's presenting in our patient is basically minimal to none. Because ultimately what that patient needed that I showed you was an aggressive hand irrigation multiple times in the shift or they, they deserve to have an actual hematuria catheter. That, that patient, if I had hematuria, there's absolutely no way that <clears throat> I would want to have that set up for my, it's not doing anything. That's 100% not doing anything. And if you would have looked closely at that, that picture, you would have seen that the, the red seal had actually already been pulled away. So that some of the nurses taking care of that patient knew that that was not sufficient for irrigation, although some, I don't think, really were thinking about it like that. Okay? So that's not what I want you guys to be seeing. And if you guys came across something like that, or you guys to be setting up, then I would want you to take a pause and do some education to those nurses um, <clears throat> and putting the right Foley catheter in for that patient so that we know that the hematuria is being handled appropriately. Does that make sense? Okay. So, manual irrigation techniques and timing. <clears throat> Have you guys used the irrigation tray? Okay. So we draw up the 30, we insert and we pull back. You draw up the 30, insert and pull back. Um, and you, sometimes you irrigate until clear or you irrigate until you have a, a d decreased amount of fully, uh, clots that you're receiving out. Is everybody familiar with continuous bladder irrigation mm -hmm. or CBI? Good. Okay. So again, I already talked to you about the hematuria catheter on, on that you don't have to put the largest hematuria catheter in. You can start with a smaller hematuria catheter. It has three different ports. Do we know what the three different ports are? <coughs> okay. There are times that we have to put a hematuria catheter in for the hand irrigation purposes, and we will put a plug in the third port so that um, if we needed to hook up CBI, then we could. Um, <clears throat> so just have that in the back of your mind. And if you are weaning off the CBI and they don't need to have the CBI anymore, you can utilize that plug versus taking that hematuria catheter out and then not having it when you actually needed it. Okay, so possible complications. So um, this was a case that I had in a previous facility. This was not actually our facility, but this is a, this is a true scenario. So the Foley balloon um, was inflated um, in the actual urethra of the patient. The patient was in the ICU, they had a rising creatinine because they weren't able to get anything out, right? So they were backing up. They needed to have multiple transfusions because they were bleeding. Catheter was obstructing the outflow um, and actually caused some bleeding. Um, the patient also had a three-way Foley, so we were filling up the bladder even more and the patient wasn't able to get anything out. <clears throat> and it didn't have any good outflow. So making sure that the Foley catheter is in all the way before we actually inflate the balloon. And this particular urologist that I was working with felt that the three-way that we were doing more damage than good, but I think that we're able to insert a three-way Foley catheter and, and still, feel, still feel good with the care that we're delivering for the patient. So let's talk about this a little bit. So what do you, what do you guys fill the, the Foley catheter balloon with? So I heard say like Sarah Water. Sarah Water. Who said that? Nice to hear. Correct. So why would we use Sarah Water versus saline? <coughs> it crystallizes. Have you ever walked up to a Foley catheter and you're like, I cannot get this out. I cannot pull anything else out of this Foley catheter balloon. It, I, it's empty, you know, I, I pulled back what I, what, everything I possibly could, then you have another nurse walk in there, they take a 10 cc syringe like they have a different technique, and then they try to pull back, and they're not able to get anything out, but then when you actually try to go and pull that Foley catheter out, it doesn't come. And you don't understand why it doesn't come. Well, it doesn't come because if we put normal saline actually in there, it'll crystallize, and then it'll, it'll cause issues for when we're actually trying to pull it out. 
and then Dr. Gruber's here, I'll just finish my little nursing part of the spiel, and then Dr. Gruber, I'll take you through the slides that I need your urologist uh, feedback on for teaching. Um, so complications, so improper inflation of the balloon can cause false passages. Um, what we talked about on Tuesday is, is how many times do you really try before you get somebody else to help? And we really talked about that two really needs to be it. So I try once, I can't get it, but maybe I didn't get it because I you know, put it in the vagina. So I'll try again in, in the, in the urethra for the female. But for, for a male, we really just, if you can't get it, you can't get it. And there's times even that I walk into a room as an eating nurse and I'm like, ooh, I don't even know that anatomy. Like uh, you know, things are falling out all over the place and I don't know where I should even go. So there's times that I don't even attempt even as what I would consider myself as an expert fully placer. And then if we do have a false passage, that's when we really need to have the urologist that comes in. So if we've attempted, as a difficult Foley team, calling the urologist to let them know so that they can come in with a flexible scope and kind of make sure that they know exactly where they're going with their, with their Foley placement. Okay, I'll hand it over. Dr. Gruber, I'll just control the slides here for you so that, and then I'll talk with you about the bullet points that we want you to, to make sure that you're highlighting. And if you'll stand right here in this space. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry, I kind of messed up the calendar. It's okay. You want to introduce yourself, Dr. Gruber? Yeah, I'm Dr. Gruber. I'm a urologist. I started practice here in 1982, believe it or not. And uh, um, I, I did a little stint as a CMO for a couple of years, but now I'm back doing urology. Um, so, um, male anatomy um, and that's the, the difficulty with a catheter is that, you know, you hold the penis straight out and um, so if you kind of turn this 90 degrees so the patient's laying down and they're holding the penis straight up. So every, the direction that you're, that you can push the catheter is, you know, straight down, downward, which is this direction. And the problem is the curve. And the problem is, is that men, uh, as we get older, our prostates get bigger and it creates more of an acute angle here. So it, it becomes even more of an acute angle. So you're pushing downward. And the other thing is that the, 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 the external sphincter is right here. So um, I kind of talk a patient through uh, when I'm passing a catheter, because you know, I tell them you know, at the beginning it's gonna be a little bit of a burning, you'll feel it going down. But when I get right to your prostate, which really I mean his external sphincter, he's going to feel like he needs to urinate and the first reaction is to clamp down. So I, that's where I talk him through that. I say as I'm getting close to your prostate you're going to get a strong sense to void and it's going to make you want to clamp down but if you can possibly just relax as if you're going to, if you're going to urinate and as you talk to them as you're doing it it's kind of a distraction. It helps it helps them not focus so much on what you're feeling, I mean, what they're feeling, what you're doing. So uh, that's probably the biggest cause of false passages because he clamps down, you're pushing, and what you're doing with a false passage is that you're, you're, you're forcing the, the tip of the catheter underneath the elevated. It just seems like every time you try to pass a catheter, it just goes that direction. So, um, um, that's where a, um, if the catheter just will, you know, if, if it hits something and it's okay to push a little bit, but if you start pushing really hard, you're in danger of creating a false pass, especially in an older man with an enlarged, and you have to assume they're going to have an enlarged prostate. Um, you're familiar with the Coudé catheter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, we spoke about the CUDA catheter, and Dr. Moskowitz, how he described the CUDA catheter and the prostate is that you're trying to get it through. The regular Foley catheter would come up and bump, and this is what I already talked to him about, but the CUDA would come up, bump, but then slide up and through. Right, it's the curve. It's, it's the curve that, that helps because it's, you know, again, you're, you're, <coughs> you're pushing this way, and you want it to turn that way, and, and the curve, that little curve can be amazingly helpful. Okay. So, um, you know, putting a catheter in a woman, simple, slam dunk, why is that a problem? Well, it can be a problem. Um, you know, the, the body habitus of the patient, 
sometimes patients have you know massive lymphedema their legs um, it, it uh, some uh, women can get uh, stenosis of their urethra especially older women just from uh, atrophic changes you know postmenopausal changes uh, but the, the biggest difficulty is that it's, you know, if you have a large woman or if she's got a problem with her legs, uh, the urethra may not be just right there. It, it, it may be hard to even see that. And then sometimes the urethra is farther in. And the, the trick that I use is um, I get a, a vaginal speculum and I take the, the, the anterior, the top part off. I just have the posterior part of the, of the vaginal speculum and I put that in the vagina and I pull downward. And most of the time, the urethra just comes into view when you do that. And when you're doing this, I, when you're doing this in bed, it's very difficult. You know, whenever I have a problem, I'll put the patient up in stirrups, and, which really helps me. Uh, but when they're in bed, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get your head down there and, and you can't see and you don't have good light. I don't know how easy it is on some floors to literally just take the patient to a room where you can do like a pelvic exam, that kind of table. But that's that's always the trick that we do. We we want to we want to put them up in lithotomy. We want a posterior blade of a vaginal speculum. And so what's the what's the trick that I talked to you guys just right now? Bed pan. Bed pan. Sit on the bed pan. Yeah, get them up on the bed pan. Flip it upside down so that the the solid surface is underneath their butt that will raise them up and then put their legs like a frog leg. So when you don't have that particular stretcher, stretcher available, then you still have that same functionality. Yeah. But when we, as, as I said, in the postmenopausal women can have, you could see the meatus, but you may not be able to get a catheter to go through it because of stenosis. And that's sometimes best to stop. I mean, you can use a smaller catheter, but even if that won't go, it's really best to stop because it's pretty easy for us. And. Um, you, you can tell if the meatus is stenotic. I mean, you, you'd be able to tell. Uh, so BPH we talked about, uh, that's enlarged prostate. Um, thymosis uh, is where the, the foreskin is not retractable. Um, a, lo a lot of times what I'll do is um, I can get the lubricant on my little finger and I can kind of work my way in, in there and, and dilate the the opening of the thymotic foreskin somewhat. If it's painful, you can't do that. Um, and then I kind of squirt uh, soap down in there because you're not going to be able to prep the penis. But you, it's kind of like picking a lock. You know, you can get it if you can get it through the opening of the thymotic foreskin, and you kind of through this through the penile skin feel where the glands, the head of the penis is. You you can kind of get the get the catheter into the meatus, and if it starts to go, it, it goes. A lot of men with phimosis will have the second thing. They may have meatal stenosis because they're not able to retract their foreskin. And that's, you know, there's cross, constant irritation to the meatus, and it will stenose, it will, it will narrow. If someone has meatal stenosis, that's something that you have to get the urologist involved. The stricture is, um, can we go back to that very first? So the stricture is, is a scarring somewhere from here to here. It's usually in the bulbous urethra. A stricture is usually, is usually caused by a straddle injury, and it could have happened 20, 30 years ago. And you fall on your bike and you straddle. You fall on a fence and you straddle, and you injure the urethra. And you're a kid, so you, know, you don't tell anybody. Um, but as time goes by, it scars, and scarring contracts, so it, it gets really small. <coughs> And, um, and so when you're passing a catheter, as you get more experience with passing a catheter, you can tell that, you know, it seems to stop here. It, it, I, I don't think I've pushed it in all the way to the prostate, but it's hitting something. And if that's the case, I mean, that's a stricture, and if you start pushing really hard, you will create a false passage. But it's the time to stop and get the urologist. Um, I talked about obesity in women, and it's the same thing in men sometimes. It, it, the penis is retracted way down in there somewhere. And I usually get a couple of people to help me, and, and <coughs> by pushing down around the penis, I, I usually can feel the head and, and literally pull up. And, and by pushing down all the 
adipose tissue around it and pull the penis up, a lot of times you can find it where you don't think you would. Um, and it can be really difficult. No problem in calling your urologist. We talked about the tight sphincter and kind of talking the patient through it. Uh, do we have a hypospadia picture? Yes, we do later on, and I'll get to that. Okay. And, then if we just, and we also have a um, sphincter as well, so. Yeah, artificial, do we have, we have okay. it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I covered the lidocaine jelly for the men, um, and you utilize the <coughs> right now. Anxious is already on there. Um, I don't know if you want to cover the BPH for the bigger catheter or the CUDE catheter, um, but otherwise I, I did cover quite a bit. Yeah, um, make sure you reduce the foreskin to prevent parapimosis. You would not believe how often that we see that. And that, that is a very painful thing, and it's a very painful thing for us to, to take care of. Um, hold up the panis, we were just talking about that. And then I covered this, and we covered utilizing um, sterile water versus saline because it crystallizes in the balloon, which doesn't allow us to pull it out. I don't know if there's anything more you'd like to stay on that. Now, the, the trick with the, with the 18 is that you know, the bigger the catheter, it's a little bit stiffer. And, you know, if you, if you feel like that, that you're not creating a false passage and you just feel like, and it's just a matter of experience in doing it a few times, and you feel like that I, I can tell, I can tell that I'm, I, I can tell I'm, I'm far enough in that I'm in the prostate, and I can tell that I haven't created a false passage, and the catheter just seems to not be stiff enough. You can go to 18, but that's that's kind of a leap of faith, and uh, sometimes it's best not to do that. So there's a stricture. Um, this is called a retrograde urethrogram, and this is the external sphincter, and this is the prostate. So th this is the bulbous urethra, and that's, you know, that's right in the perineum where you'd have a straddle in your And, uh, you know, asking the patient about their history, if someone's had a, either a TURP or a radical prostatectomy, um, the, the bladder and the prostate, you know, obviously join, and right where they join is called the bladder neck. And again, like a stricture, any scarring will constrict. So with either of these operations, there can be scarring right at the bladder neck. And so it's like a stricture, but it's right at the bladder neck. And uh, um, that's where you're getting the catheter pretty far in, but it just will not go in. And, and starting to push real hard there is not going to be successful. But that, those are real obstructions that usually we have to take people to the OR to open up. So that's a case of phimosis, but you're able to retract the foreskin somewhat enough where you can see the meatus. And then because of the phimosis, they may have meatal stenosis. Um, and uh, that's getting beyond what, if, if, if a catheter, you know, 16 French won't go in there, you can try a 14, but if it won't go, then you really need, need a urologist. So here's a hypospadia. So a hypospadia is a congenital anomaly. When, you know, when, the, when the male fetus is early in development, everything is open because it's unisex. You know, it's not, is it going to be a vagina? Is it going to be a scrotum and a penis? It's just open. And if it's a male, it, uh, as the fetus develops, the closure begins from here upward. So the scrotum comes together, and then the urethra starts to close. But if there's an arrest in that development, the urethra could be anywhere, anywhere along the, the shaft of the penis. Uh, a lot of times, uh, the the mid shafts, you know, is usually going to be taken care of. Uh, the pediatrician's going to recognize it. The parents are going to recognize it. That's usually going to be approached as a child. Occasionally, it's not. But the more distal uh, hypospadia is like here. Um, Maybe the parents did not want to have anything done, or the pediatrician didn't encourage any cosmetic repair. And so um, the, the, on the glands, there is a, a pit that, that does develop no matter what. So you could look at the glands and think you see a meatus, 
but the meatus may really be where it says subcoronal. So if you see the meatus, and it doesn't seem to be a scarring like a meatal stenosis, but it just won't, it just won't go. Look, look down the the shaft of the penis, and you may find the meatus. And it's usually quite adequate. It's usually quite easy to get into. We talked about pimosis and cannot retract the foreskin. And, and uh, get lucky, that's like, you know, <laughs> getting a safe to open. Then we talked about overweight. So uh, what we had also talked about, you you use a speculum. Uh, what I had used as a, as a nurse on a urology floor was finger, uh, so that I could kind of identify where the vagina was. Yeah. Or if we accidentally put the Foley catheter in the vagina, leave it there, go get a different kit, and then you know at least where the vagina is. Yeah, sometimes leaving it in the, leaving in the vagina will block it. When the second catheter, it may, the one in the vagina will block the catheter from going in the vagina and you might get lucky, it might go in the urethra. Right. And then I had, Dr. Moskowitz had shared a photo with me of how we were utilizing the specimen port to do some irrigation. So we, we discussed hematuria, we discussed some hand irrigation, and when, when to utilize a three-way Foley. I don't know if you have anything else that you would like to, <coughs> if you have a burning desire to talk about hematuria, because I'm sure it's probably pretty common. Do you all have questions about what to do? Um, you know, the big, when there's blood uh, in the urine, there can be clots in the bladder, and if you have a 16 <coughs> trench, uh, you're not going to get clots through the lumen of that. So we go to bigger catheters, um, and sometimes that's, that's more difficult to get in in a male if you're putting a 22 or 24 French catheter in. But um, it really takes a 22 or a 24 French catheter to be able to possibly get clots out of the bladder. And um, with the manual irrigation, you know, the patient's bladder may be full already. So um, basically I put the catheter tip syringe and I just pull back really, really hard. Um, if nothing wants to come out, then I'll get not a lot, maybe 20 or 30 cc's just to kind of, maybe there's a clot at the tip of the cat and I'll try to push that away. But if the patient's really full of urine already, and you take 60 cc's of water or saline and push that in, I mean, that's pretty miserable. So it's just a little bit to try to get a clot away from the opening of the catheter, but then pull back really hard. Are you all familiar with that? So artificial urinary sphincter, um, this is placed for incontinence. Um, probably the most common reason is a man who's had a radical prostatectomy and he has become incontinent. Um, it's a three, three pieces, the cup around the urethra, the, the reservoir of fluid, and then this pump, which is, which is in the scrotum. So it's, it's quite obvious. I mean, it's, it, look, it looks like that. It's usually very superficial. And um, you don't really, so the way it works is, is that the cup is inflated all the time. And when the patient wants to void, he feels for the cup in the scrotum and he pushes here where the pump is and that transmits the fluid back to the reservoir. And it will stay open for about two minutes and it recycles, it fills itself. So, um, so the cup is inflated, so you do not want to force a catheter through that. And if someone needs a catheter, uh, the, uh, the cuff is in, inactivated. So, so a urologist will uh, pump, pump the pump, send the fluid back to the reservoir, and then this button, you push the button really hard and that kind of locks it. It locks it where the fluid will stay in the reservoir. So the, the, the sphincter is inactivated the whole time the catheter is. What you would be doing? Well, this, these are used for the, the stricture and the filiform is, uh, is the very small little tube on the bottom. And um, some of them are straight and some of them have a pigtail. And you kind of feel and twist and manipulate it through the stricture. And it's got a female end on it. And then the followers have a male end that you screw into the, to the filiform. And the, as you pass the follower, the filiform is guiding you through the stricture and you bring it out and you unscrew it and you get the next bigger size. And you, you, so you make three, four, or five passes to dilate. It's actually not done that much anymore. 
Um, but I'm an old time urologist, so I still use it. But my new partner, he's he's never used these. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, I already went over them with the urology cart and just being knowledgeable so that if they do call the urologist to come in to place a Foley catheter to please make sure that the cart's available and ready for your use. Um, the CUNA catheter we pushed, we, we sent around the room, uh, talked with them about the, the uh, balloon being at the top for the insertion so that you know that you're going the right way in, into the urethra. And then we talked about the three-way catheter. So <clears throat> this is more nursing that's right here, is making sure that we're washing our hands, utilizing all the tools that are within the kit. You know, you have uh, a way to, I'm coming at you. Uh, utilizing all the tools that are within the kit, the stat lock that's there. Uh, Dr. Moskowitz um, ha was very emotional about the stat lock, that he wants education on how to undo the stat lock. It was cute. Um, he can just reference his nurse, right? Because I know that we all know how to undo the stat lock. Um, one Foley, one time, so don't, don't attempt to go in and if you miss it, you get to use that Foley again. You know, make sure that you're uh, going and getting a, a different Foley catheter. Peri care, when we're doing those hack attack rounds, we're looking at, at the Foley catheter. That's, that's how I'm going to know if you're doing a good job with, with daily maintenance. Um, because you guys are going to be opening up the system and not having a closed system, this is really important to make sure that your, document, your documentation is on point with how you inserted the Foley catheter because if we have a cotty, it's going to go back to the, the insertion or it's going to go back to the daily maintenance. Don't have a the insertion. We want to make sure that we have good techniques. And I already talked about open versus closed system. These are different reasons that we can have a Foley catheter um, placed. Uh, we're actually moving the emergency department to a, like a Foley free zone. Um, so that we're not placing a lot of Foley catheters. So don't be surprised if up on the floor you're getting patients without Foley's because we're trying to decrease the amount of Foley's that we're putting in. And then right now what we'll do is just the, um, a simulation for a sign-off. Um, but before that happens, I want to make sure that you see if you guys have any questions for Dr. Gruber.